Hello, Eel Talk community. It gives us great pleasure to welcome you again in, in English this time. Today, we'll be discussing the challenges teachers face in the context of face-to-face -face classes. We've got Andreas Hagigorgiu, who is based in London, and Alexa Barriano, who is a teacher of English as a second language based in the United States. Hi, Alexa. Hi, Karen. Hi, community of podcast listeners. Thank you for having me. Hello, Andres. How are you? Hello. I'm well. Thank you for having me. Andres is an English teacher, a part-time English teacher in London, and he's a full-time Greek teacher in London as well, in primary schools. Now, you know, the pandemic uh, hit all of us, and there was a moment when they... Uh, the countries decided to go back to school. How did this happen in the United States? When did you start going back to school? How was it? And tell us about that. Okay, I can tell you a little bit about like just that journey. So I think in the United States, first it's important to understand that um, public school is governed by state power, not by federal power. So every single state made different decisions about closing schools, opening schools, based on what the state wanted. So because I teach in New York City, I can only talk really about what happened in New York. So in New York, um, basically all schools shut down in March of 2020. And we shut down, we went to remote learning. It was a difficult transition because nobody, a lot of teachers didn't really know how to use any online tools. And so that was very chaotic. And mm -hmm. a lot of students basically lost a lot of learning in those months, but thankfully it was at the end of the year. So we stayed closed until the end of the school year, which for us is in June. And then in mm -hmm. September, after having the summer and the Department of Education tried to, you know, give better tools, make sure that all students had access to technology because they were having to deliver iPads to people's houses because some a lot of kids didn't have access. So over the summer, they were able to kind of do a better job with that. And then when we opened again in September, we opened with some difficulties. The school opened late because They had to be checked, the buildings, for ventilation, for protocols dealing with COVID cases, for protection given to teachers like masks, gloves, hand sanitizer. All of those things are being negotiated between the city and the union, the teachers union. So finally, when we opened again at the end of September, students could choose to come in person or learn remotely. So it wasn't like everyone came back. Only students who wanted to come back came back. Andres, can you tell us how the comeback to school, to face-to-face -to -face lessons started in England, in UK? So we started uh, going back to school uh, in March 2021. And until uh, the end of the uh, school year, the previous school year, Uh, there were restrictions like uh, the children and the teachers had to wear face masks. Uh, we had to wash our hands regularly. Uh, they were, um, we had a single file lines walking in the corridors. Uh, the children had different uh, play times and uh, it was a reduced amount of, um, that we couldn't miss, mix Uh, classes we had like bubbles uh, like classroom bubbles in between the year groups and even the staff couldn't uh, uh, mix with each other but um, from since September uh, these restrictions were lifted mm -hmm. so it feels like more normal we still are uh, we are careful but uh, it feels more Uh, normal. And how about the teaching per se? The, the, how was the interaction between teachers and students? Were you actually teaching the content of the subject or were you probably more into uh, reassuring that the students understood the, the, this new context or what was it like? So I think because I taught high school and you know older kids so they were pretty aware of what was going on 
and the high school kids specifically, I think the ones who chose to come in person because they got to make the choice, they wanted to be in person. Like they knew that they didn't learn well remotely because they experienced it from March to June the, the last year. So the ones who came in person were really motivated to be there. And so in some ways, even though this, the, like the day-to-day -day stress was chaotic because of what I said, not having enough teachers, the actual teaching of the students in some ways was actually better than it was before because the classes were much smaller because of restrictions. So you had to have six feet of distance between each kid, which means that, you know, the year before COVID, I had a class of 34. And then during COVID, my biggest class was like 16. So you got to know the kids much better. And um, there were actual positive things, I think, about the teaching. Mm -hmm. And do you think we have, or in, that, in this case in London, do you think people in the UK, students in the UK and teachers and parents, they feel that they have gone back to what they used to be before the pandemic or there is a change in the school? What is it that they give more importance to? Is it the same? Or maybe now they are more worried about how students feel, if they are accessing the resources, if parents feel comfortable with their kids being in the school. Uh, we didn't have any issues with parents. Are, parents are not allowed uh, still at school. Uh, and also parents evening are also doing um, uh, like uh, via Zoom. Mm -hmm. They haven't, haven't met. Uh, I'm, I haven't got. I haven't. I don't have a, a class uh, in in my English school. I'm mm -hmm. teaching in different uh, uh, year groups, so I don't have a a, a class. I don't meet parents. Mm -hmm. I don't meet. I don't <laughs> meet parents. But I meet parents in at the Greek school that I'm teaching uh, from Tuesday to Saturday, and. Uh, uh, there are no issues. Uh, they are they are sure they are sure that those gaps that they are built those uh, during those uh, months and year they will they'll catch up. And what about the teachers? Did they decide to go back or they had to go back and also teach from home? Okay, the like? teacher. So on the teacher level, if you you could apply for a medical accommodation to not go back. And it was pretty easy to get a medical accommodation. So I would say that in a lot of buildings, you only had about 50% of the teachers in the building. And then the other 50% were at home teaching remotely. So that made it really difficult to do programming, mm -hmm. right? Um, it made it really hard on the teachers that were in person. So I was in person. And it meant that a lot of times we didn't have enough staff. So. Mm -hmm. You know, if one teacher would call out the whole, we would all have to cover each other's classes. Substitute teachers didn't mm -hmm. really want to work during this time. So there was mm -hmm. a real like lack of substitute teachers. So it was very chaotic and difficult to mm -hmm. manage. Uh, sorry, Alexa. Yeah. Uh, and what about parents? How was uh, the relationship with parents leaving their children at the school and parents whose children were not going to school but having this distance education? So I think that parents who had their kids at home, who made that choice maybe because they were worried about COVID, right? They struggled a lot. There was, it was very hard for parents to be at home, having a lot of them were working full time from home, but then having to manage their kids as well. And maybe for my students, it wasn't so bad because they're high school students and they're more self-sufficient, but the parents who had kids in elementary school or even middle school, they were, They were struggling because they both didn't want to put their children in danger to send them to school, but also were overwhelmed at home. So when the schools, so in September we opened, but then we only stayed open for two months because the cases in New York hit 3% in the beginning of November. And the, the union, like, because we have a strong teachers union, they had only agreed to open schools if the city promised to close them again if the infection rate hit 3%. So as soon as it hit 3%, all the schools closed again in November. So, and then you had to change, and then that had a lot of, it was like really hard to make 
you know, principals, assistant principals had to redo all the schedules. They made different, they, they made maybe four different schedules last year for programming because of all of these changes. And then we stayed closed. High schools stayed closed until the end of March. Mm-hmm. And then in March 2021, we reopened again. And I think parents were very happy to be able to send their kids to school. <laughs> yeah. And this coming and uh, back and, you know, and closing and again, how, how did it affect the learning process or the relationship between teachers and the students and the school? So it was really difficult because, again, I was an in-person teacher. So all the students that I had had chosen that they wanted in-person learning. So every, so even though in school they were really motivated and like I said, it was actually a great experience. Every time that we shut down, it was very hard because they didn't want to learn remotely. Like they had chosen not to learn remotely. Like I had kids who in March of 2020, in those months, they had like mental breakdowns because they didn't, also because a lot of my students had family situations and home situations where school was an escape for them. And so there were a lot of socio-emotional issues attached to it as well. Um, so when the schools would close down, I would have to call a lot of those students to try to get them to come to the remote classes. And also not even just for learning, but because like legitimately I was worried about their mental health. Wow, yeah, talking about mental health, how did you feel as a teacher? throughout all this because you've been telling us a lot about parents and students. What about you? Um, I think that as teachers, we really like to be organized and we really like to plan. And that's something that a lot of teachers have in common is maybe this desire to have like some control. And this this situation tested a lot of those things because every day you didn't know what was going to happen. Even when we went back, if you had too many cases, you would just get an email saying um, school is closed and then it would be closed for 10 days. Or you might be in the middle of a class and maybe students are doing some independent work. You check your email and you get an email saying you've been in contact. You have been in contact with somebody who has COVID because they were doing testing every week. You must go home now in the middle of the day. You know, so it was Like I said, it, yeah, it was wow. stressful. You didn't have a lot of control over what was happening. Mm -hmm. And then also a lot of teachers had to teach things that maybe they didn't feel so comfortable teaching because, uh, like I said, principals had to redo the schedules many times and they couldn't always respect the teacher's area of expertise. So mm -hmm. a lot of last year, I taught math. <gasps> Mathematics, wow. Yeah. I taught algebra one, algebra two, and geometry. And I had to teach algebra one in Spanish. Because <laughs> we, we teach wow. algebra, we teach the Very first- Very challenging. Like, How do yeah, you think it went? <laughs> I mean, it went as well as it could have, I guess. But I think that it was just a, a lot about, it was testing people's flexibility. You had to be just really flexible in order mm -hmm. to maintain your own mental well-being. Because if you wanted to have too much control, It, it was. It would be very hard emotionally. Wow. Do you still remember how you felt when you first started this con this new way of interacting with with students and with your colleagues? What was so it like? So at the beginning, like mm -hmm. uh, and the head teacher helped us uh, a lot. So uh, at the beginning, uh, every, I was worried, like. Mm -hmm. Uh, everyone. Uh, I didn't have my vaccine until uh, August, so I was one of the... Um, I had it in Cyprus, so I was one of the uh, last ones to have it, mm -hmm. but I had it uh, eventually, so I was more worried because I didn't have my vaccine back, uh, back then. Uh, we're worried because I, had, uh, I was wearing the face masks all the time, Uh, and the children are still, and back then, were wearing the face masks, and they were, uh, we tried to do the lesson as uh, more interesting and uh, more, um, not so hard work, and slowly, mm -hmm. slowly back to, and children had like, um, 
uh, there was children that they didn't have any uh, access to uh, the resources, they didn't do any work, so mm -hmm. had to face that uh, as well. But they still have, uh, we still have um, uh, some, the children are behind in mm -hmm. their, where they had, they were, uh, but slowly, I think now we are uh, getting there. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you are, because in the UK, what, 100% of schools are already face-to-face, -face, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. In what moment did you see that change, when everybody felt more like relieved and trusting that their children were going to be safe, that you yourself was going to be safe in the school? I think September, that's, uh, that uh, mm -hmm. summer uh, break, mm -hmm. uh, felt like uh, a new start, like mm -hmm. a fresh, fresh, fresh new start. Uh, that when I felt and uh, I saw the children like uh, more uh, in the school environment, more comfortable. Mm -hmm. What do you think, because now the United States or at least in New York, everybody's back to school, right? Everybody's back now. So what do you think um, work well now looking back what was that thing that yes this is what other Probably. states or other countries may, may may you know try to apply it i think that something that works really well is trying to take some of the practices that we learned from remote learning and bringing them into the classroom because they're in order to be good at teaching on zoom we had to use a lot of different technologies that maybe many teachers had never used before And some of those technologies actually also work really well in the classroom. So I don't know, one thing that I, I don't know if you guys use this in Peru, but one thing that I used a lot when I was teaching on Zoom was Pear Deck. And then I also used it in the classroom because I thought it was such an excellent tool and maybe it was a tool I never would have learned or discovered if I hadn't, um, if I hadn't done remote teaching. So I think that maybe making it more organized, so taking some of those tools and literally make, doing some professional development for teachers about what they can bring back to the classroom that would be effective. What did we learn from being remote? And I think another thing would be, and I don't know how realistic this is, but would be to rethink school, rethink the way that we do school, right? We've done school for a long time that you come Monday through Friday, you come from 8 a.m. till 3 p.m., and this is the structure of school and everyone has to come. Maybe that's not true anymore. Maybe we can use certain things we learned from remote learning to help vulnerable populations. Maybe some kids can't come to school all the time or that's not the best thing for them, right? Um, I just think there's a lot that we could do. Like in my school right now, they were petitioning to change the schedule to a four day a week schedule and have Friday be for planning but I think that they wouldn't have even thought of that if this I think something about what happened with COVID is opening up people's possibilities of rethinking not just school but just their jobs in general wow yeah that's powerful Alexa because yeah it, I think we need to rethink about everything and school is so essential for a country's progress and and the people and If we go back to what we were before COVID, maybe we have not learned a lesson. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, I think so too. So, Andres, uh, what would you advise to Peruvian teachers for the comeback to face-to-face -face classes? So, at the beginning, I think you shouldn't press uh, students with too much work and, um, Uh, work on their feelings and uh, slowly, slowly to um, uh, get back to school routine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the recommendation is that we should pay more attention to their emotions, their uh, how they feel back in there, and uh, no pressure, and slowly, slowly uh, bring them back to their school routine. Great, great. Thank you, Andreas. I think it's it's going to be really helpful because we get 
you know, as teachers get desperate and we want students to learn lots of content sometimes. And what you're telling us is really valuable. If we really want to go back, we should first pay attention to the motions. Yes. Thank you. Is there anything else you would like to add regarding this, um, you know, Peru is coming back to face-to-face -to -face classes soon. It is expected that next year everybody should be back. Mm -hmm. But uh, what do you think teachers uh, would, would uh, hear from you as last as your last I, words? Okay, I think the two things that I would say is like advice or just things to consider and keep in mind, especially because Peru has been remote for basically two years, which is even longer than we have. Um, first, to, to put socio-emotional learning first, right? It's important to get students to reintegrate properly so that they can feel ready to learn because I'm sure that some students will have suffer, will suffer from social anxiety after such a long time being quarantined. And so you can't have students engage academically if they aren't first feeling comfortable like socially. So using that first month maybe, not to focus so much on academics, but to focus on bonds between people creating classroom culture, especially kids who maybe have transitioned from one type of school to the next, right? Like if you were in eighth grade when the pandemic started, now you're in high school and you've never even been to high school. Um, and then the other thing that I think I would say at the on the academic side is do baseline assessments, figure out where they're at. You know, they may not be where they should be, quote unquote, right? Where you expect a ninth grader to be. But if you don't know where they are and you just start off by what you think they should be, I think that it will be really difficult to help catch up the learning that has been lost. Thank you, Alexa. Thank you. Thank you for your advice. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you one more time. You're welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. Good luck to Peru on the reopening. It's not an easy thing, but I'm sure that it will be beautiful for a lot of people. Yes, it will. And thank you, EEL Talk community, for being there. Bye bye until the next episode. EEL Talk teaches talk. Las opiniones vertidas en este podcast son de exclusiva responsabilidad de quienes la emiten.